Hello, thanks for being here. Thanks for being sober of sorts. I'm talking today about a thing that's very important to me, and that is fixing the mobile web. And the first thing when you say that is like, ah, oh, there's no mobile web, there's only the web. And then like, oh, talk to clients for a change, or talk to people that come from native environment and go into the web, and they will not understand what you mean with what is the web. But I want to go more meta on this. I want to go more, uh, more interestingly, I found a few things in my life lately that, uh, that made me happy and that made me understand things much more. And one of the things is that, that we all deserve beautiful things. And we all deserve them. And we uh, rid ourselves of beautiful things for the sake of being faster, for the sake of even having more, for the sake of being the one that has the thing that other people don't have, even if it's not finished yet. We've given up a lot on quality for quantity, and a lot on quality for consumption, and having the newest, coolest thing. At the talk that we saw yesterday, where we learned that if we have a correction facility for people, for criminals to go to, so that they don't go back into crime, and you make the place beautiful, then it is a correction facility, and not a blame facility. People go there and come out with empowerment and basically feel better and feel that they, well, I, maybe I need to do a change in my life. And not just, yeah, I'm already a criminal, here's my gang colors, fuck you. So we learn that making things beautiful makes people better and makes people more empowered and makes people feel better about themselves as well. Now, the other day I watched uh, uh, James Bond Casino Royale and it was still the first act, so uh, Eva Green has shown up on screen, so I still discovered things on the screen, apart from her. And I realized that there is this wonderful book, and you might know where this is going. Um, and in the, in the Bond franchise, I've been looking at a lot of these movies and a, a lot of the making of as well, clothing was always a very important part. The, the, the character of Bond was defined by his clothing. He would not come out in the morning with like pajama pants and a t-shirt that's completely messed up. He would wake up in a tuxedo. Which of course is pointless, but it made him, it made him the special person that he is. And Daniel Craig, I thought like this Photoshop looks really, really cool. Now I'm a geek. I have the internet. I have the power. I can do research. We research everything on the internet, and we're really good at that. Like, like which house of Hogwarts did Gandalf go to before he came a Jedi and things like that. <laughs> and semicolons at the beginning, at the end of the sentence, and these kind of things. But I was like, where did that shirt come from? What is that shirt being made of and who did it? And I thought, this is impossible to do. In the 80s, remember before the internet, you would not find out where that shirt came from. Did a research. It's a company actually in England that's called Sunspell, which has been established in 1860, which I was a bit, sort of, was a bit fishy because I lived in England for 13 years and I haven't had any Sunspell last than 24 hours in so far. But they introduced the box shot to England which is quite an interesting tidbit as well. And I went in there and I saw the polo shirt, and I have it now. This is the polo shirt at the Riviera. And it's, uh, that's why I look like Daniel Craig. <laughs> <laughs> but he started it. from the 90s crimes back to uh, the Sunspell. Uh, the shop was actually 10 minutes away from the Mozilla office in London, and I've never seen it. It's in the middle of, the, uh, in the middle of, uh, of Soho, of the gay center of Soho. And uh, there's like these horrible sex shops next to it, and really bad bars. In the middle there's this really expensive clothing store. And I went in there, and you would expect them to have a massive cutout of Daniel Craig or me there, <laughs> saying like, hey, you could look like this. And nothing, not a single line of like, this is what James Bond wears, just here's our clothes. All of them in very simple colors, all of them in all sizes that you want to have. The people working in there know their stuff. I tried the thing on, and when I bought it, they gave me an extra little button and a little sewing kit in case I'm on the road and I have to put the sewing thing as well. And they, they told me where the, where the cloth came from, how it's been weaved, and all the things we geeks love that nobody else cares about but they knew that I was somebody who was interested in that. And they were happy working in there. They weren't just those broken down salespeople that you see in Ultra Jazz and shit that you can buy here. They were like, oh, I, I sell this stuff, this is pretty cool. And 
Of course, then uh, people like, uh, well, it's, we want to look like James Bond. And I was like, I felt bad. Because I come from a family that wasn't rich. Like, 80 pounds for a polo shirt? <sighs> do I really want to do this? I wore this thing and it felt great. And I was like, oh, this is... So I did it. And then, of course, to, to, to get solace from people, I put myself on Twitter and said, like, oh, I just tweeted myself to a new polo shirt. And, of course, the first answer on Twitter is, like, well, 80 pounds, are you crazy? I can find something like that in Mazatlan for four pounds. Which, of course, brings me then to the thing what Twitter is about, which I call tweeting from the cross. If somebody uh, attacks you, just go as far away as possible to something that they cannot possibly say something positive about and accuse them of doing it. So when he said, like, oh, four pounds for a polo shirt, I'm like, well, surely there's no child labor or sweatshops involved in that one. Because he cannot say, yeah, so what? Then I won. Twitter is for winning, not for having conversations. <laughs> This is what happens, but uh, I felt bad about this, and I emailed him and said that, and he said, like, yeah, I understand it, and it's actually a thing that annoys me, that people think that something that is quick and fast, and lots of it, is as good as the other thing. That you gave up on quality as soon as you can consume, and that comes from the 60s. I gave another talk about this, it's called the uh, Building Obsolescence Principle. In the 50s, people said in America, like, the only way we can save our economy is that people consume, consume, consume. So build things that break build things that actually uh, break really quickly so that people have to buy new things so they can produce more. And in the 60s then they went further and said like, make things that look outdated within a few years so people buy another one, they feel bad for having the old one. And we do that in physical products all the time, in clothing, in fashion, in computers, in laptops, in, in mobile phones. And we start doing that with our code and that annoys me. Because we should not. We should strive for quality. Because once I started wearing nicer clothes, once I actually spent money and shipped all my old stuff to the charity shop because it didn't fit any, any way anyways, I found that there are so many benefits to that. It feels great to wear. It just feels good. You just go out of the house in the morning and like, hey, this feels good. And it's not, a, it's not a price thing. It's a quality thing. If you go outside and look at the Egon shirts that the guy has there, there's a few of them that has wonderful threads in them. And they feel really good to the touch. You put them on, you're like, yes, this is a shirt I want to go out in. They also pack easily. A good cloth packs much smaller, and I travel all the time, so the less space I use in my suitcase, the better. And less space is good. You want to fold something together and carry it without breaking it. And a lot of things we do nowadays, we make smaller, and then they don't work any longer, or they just come on completely messed up. It lasts longer without fading. Like a cheap shirt, you wash a few times, and it gets gray, and it gets darker gray, and it gets blue, and then it gets yellow, and you don't know what that thing is any longer, and maybe you throw it away and buy a new one. And there's easy to maintain. This one, you wash it, you actually stretch it out after you wash it, you hang it up, you never have to iron that thing. And that's good, because I don't know how to iron it, it's just a very, very strange thing. In short, it's something to be proud of. That's why the guys in that shop were standing there and were, they were very excited about selling a thing. Not that the money came in, they, they actually showed me the cheaper one rather than the more expensive one and said, this is for you. And that's the kind of pride that I think we should have in everything that we do. Either, either if you're a designer, if you're a programmer, if you create a, a new kind of table, if you do everything, it's craftsmanship. And I think that's something that we lost a bit. How many of you can say that the day-to-day -day job, what they deliver, they're proud of getting it onto the web. Well, few, good. But most of us like, okay, we write something cool, we write a smashing night article about it and show what the world could be like. Or we should look at demos and say that like, it would be lovely if we could do that in our job. Why? Because we get into that <clears throat> mindset of selling to our clients that we can deliver things fast and change continuously and get better and faster and faster and faster. We get excited about getting, uh, uh, getting things like prototyping tools into production. That's not what they're for. Production is beautiful code. Production is beautiful design. Production is things that don't break. They're not prototyping quick things. I, I'm getting very furious about a new build script, a new methodology to roll out more things, being hyped, and basics being forgotten. Simple things like, what is the HTML of that widget? Does that make any sense to anybody who looks at source code? We looked at source code to learn web development. 
always. That was the great thing, was read and write well. And if your source code doesn't make any sense because your widget is in 15 abstractions and the browser is actually slowing down, you don't even know what the thing is, then we haven't done good. We've done fast. It's something we lost, the pride in our job. Uh, I remember when uh, Alistair Part came out and made this like Web Design L, we discussed for months how to actually do the right widget with the right fallback and how it works in different browsers. We knew all this stuff. And now this is all seen as fluff. You don't need that anymore. Stop with jQuery. Don't get, don't get any developer to think about different browsers. Chrome does everything. Everybody has Chrome. Everybody has Firefox, these kind of things. We protect newcomers coming into our market by telling them that there is this one thing that fixes everything for them. Don't worry about it. This will do it for you. That's just bad. I like failure. I like making mistakes because I don't make them again. And I think we should not deprive new people coming onto our market from getting that little adventure of finding it out by themselves rather than using something somebody clever has done for them. Now, this is the third presentation with that slide in it. But it was great. It was like I live in London, so I was excited. And uh, Tim Berners-Lee, or Timbo as I call him, was there and he typed that thing in and said, like, this web is for everyone. And Jeremy talked about that, how it's a web for makers, how everybody can be a publisher, which is true, but it doesn't have to be that far. The web is for everybody to me, which then Blaine points out rightfully that it was done on Twitter was a really bad thing. Because Twitter is not for everybody, not everybody has Twitter. Twitter doesn't result in a domain, in a URL that might be available for the future. This is not the web, it's one thing on the web. So, the web for me is for everybody, independent of, the, uh, of locality, independent of what computer you use, independent of what browser you use, independent of your ability. It's a, a mechanism to get stuff out into the world. And this is what we should be focusing on. Not like, is it the coolest newest on this phone that I have right now? But we forget about this continuously. And just a quick note on making, on becoming a publisher, webmaker.org is a project by Mozilla where we put all the tools, curriculum, uh, wiki pages, um, a batch system for learning web development and being rewarded with batches with a full gamification system in there, all for free for you to use to teach people how to use the web. And this is what we should be doing. Web literacy, every government talks about we have to teach people how to code. I don't think so. We should teach everybody how to use computers and how to publish and how to do something on the web. And do something and be a writer and a reader. And tablets and things like that turn us into consumers, and I think that's dangerous. Our craft is delivering flexibility. Every single time we make things that we suffer now for, like room booking systems, ticket systems, uh, finance systems, it was because somebody wrote something for one single browser. Our job is to deliver for all browsers, not the same thing. A thing that works, a thing that is beautiful and easy to use. So all the Internet Explorer gets some HTML and a bit of CSS, nothing else. And if you use an abstraction library to give everything to Internet Explorer 6, you also just sign the contract that you're going to spend the next 40 hours testing in Internet Explorer 6. Because otherwise you give people stuff that is broken. And I've written terrible code in 1997 that I'm not proud of, but it works in the newest browser still. If your code now works on the latest nightly build of Firefox and only on that one, and in a year's time it doesn't work anymore, then we haven't evolved, we've devolved, we've gone back to these mistakes. Our job is to make the web flexible and get everybody involved. And uh, funnily enough, uh, one person to, to, to said that quite nicely was Bruce Lee, he has this quote saying like, don't get into one form, adapt it and build your own, and let it grow, be like water. Empty your mind, be formless, shapeless, like water. Now you put water in a cup, it becomes the cup. You put water in a bottle, it becomes the bottle. You put it in a teapot, it becomes the teapot. Water can flow, or water can crash. Be water, my friend. And this is what our code should be like. It should go into the environment so that, it's, that it's actually uh, consumed in, and change, and give the right interface for the right environment. We make mobile-first interfaces that gives you massive buttons on your desktop. That's not a good experience. It should give me more different ways of interacting on the, uh, on the desktop than it does on the mobile phone. 
flexibility is what we should strive for, code quality, maintainability, understandability, specificity, just to say that I can speak it. Um, <laughs> all the things should be there in our code to make people excited. And it, I always find it funny when you people talk about UX, because UX is, it must be frustrating, because really good UX is not visible. It just means that more people use your site and are happy coming and doing the things that they've done and they're leaving. If your UX becomes visible, then probably there's a mistake in it. And it's just, it's a bit of working for redundancy, it's quite funny. So, then the big change came. And we did everything for the web, and then the iPhone came. And oh my god, the web design community went nuts. This is the future, don't go for anything else anymore, this is it. We're out of a job tomorrow, nobody's going to use the internet any longer, everybody's going to buy a school phone. Not that the whole world had to wait for months for them to actually be delivered in their countries. But it was the new thing. It was like, oh, this is the end of whatever we did before. And it was much more than a browser. That's what most people, first of all, didn't understand. A, a smartphone gets rid of all this 1980s technology and puts it into one little thing. And after four or five generations, the camera will be good as well. And the recording will be okay. And you can actually start making phone calls without dropping the line. But you gotta hold it like that, and it doesn't work. And that's where it got confusing for us, because as web developers who wrote HTML, HTML, JavaScript, and CSS, we never had access to the camera, we never had access to the microphone, we had to use Flash for that. And we had massive security faults in Flash because of that. And it was like, do you really want to access the camera or allow the access to the camera to be, to be for your HTML and stuff? All these things were already there. Flash, it was great. I love that Flash is there and was there because it we learned all the things we need now already in Flash. So demonizing it and saying like, oh, we forget about this, this is old school, is incredibly stupid. Because we have the same mistakes, the same problems, the same barriers to overcome in our technology now. So the phones had all these things in it, they were all these different things, and we as web developers were like, yes, we got cool new stuff to play with, give us new toys and we go crazy. And promises were made. 2007, announcement of the, uh, of the iPhone, no SDK required. Steve Jobs sat on stage, Safari is the best browser in the world, debatable. But he said, this is all you need. You can make a phone call, you can go to the maps, you can get a photo from the camera, you can do all of this in web technology. Flash is that, yay HTML5. All everything is working in that technology. Awesome, this thing is expensive, but really we get access to all these cool new things that we never had access to in my pocket? This is amazing. And then we started trying it out. <laughs> <laughs> and we didn't get access to the camera. And we didn't get access to local storage properly. And uh, making a phone call was going to the phone thing and then being there and not going back to the page. And the user had to go back to the browser to go back to where you were before. Nothing was as promised. And even worse, inside Apple and other companies, it was basically like, yeah, this web stuff, it's all like unwashed hippies and open free things, like maybe we should have a storefront. You know, something that really works and that doesn't close down in the high street every five minutes because it goes out of, uh, out of business. Something close would be better. And we ourselves forgot very basic things of the web. We started, we started the basic idea of flexibility and everybody is allowed to, to consume our things. And we started to say, okay, it's only for the iPhone, that's okay now. It's not gonna be any other smartphone ever again anyway, so let's make it just for the iPhone. And we built incredibly stupid things. Half-hearted copy attempts. Like, these mobile websites that look like native apps and have all the different native, ID, native widgets simulated that don't perform the same way but look the same way. We're staying in the NH hotel here and on my Android I get this iOS 1.0 style interface and I'm like, that doesn't look right. <laughs> That's on my operating system. But we simulated it and it was just copying whatever was cool in the, in the native market, we put it on the web. When people say like, okay, fine, oh, three second videos on my phone. If only I could do that in HTML5. So what, do it in HTML5. And whenever we copy things from native to the web, we make the right decision to try to make it work everywhere. 
But this always means it will not be as performant and as beautiful for that one environment, because it was tailor-made for that environment. You cannot match it if you build something more flexible. That's like putting a, a hovercraft in a Formula One race and wondering why it's slower than the other ones. But try to put the Formula One car into a river and then you see the difference. <laughs> so we shouldn't copy what native is doing all the time, but come up with things that only the web can do and not native technology. And we built these inconvenient interfaces. This was um, flying back from the States last time. This is American Airlines, or as I call it, hell. <laughs> <laughs> For eight hours, I was sitting like this. This is how much space there was. And you basically had a touch screen to watch the few movies that they offered you. And you had this remote control, which was a reminiscent from when they did have touch screens in there, which is good if the touch screen doesn't work because kids throw up on them or something, whatever happens on planes. You can still use the buttons. But the remote was here. So every time I put my arm down, I changed the channel. Okay. Take the remote out, drop it on the side so the flight attendant falls over it. That's okay. And then I had this pit in my armpit, basically, <laughs> I couldn't put anything in there. So I had to basically take my t-shirt and roll it up and put it in there, so I was able to use that $2,400 flight. Really? That's the interface that you think is good for that? Instead of putting this thing on the, on the outside, where you only need it on demand, and have a normal, like, padded thing where I can put my arm, we just put it in there to save space. We do the same thing. Like, oh yeah, let's make a minified widget that it's only 3K to do that little animation that we could do in two lines of code. Uh, airport in Barcelona. This is the logging system if you uh, open it up on your, Firefox, uh, on your Android device. Um, optimized for iPhone 1. Like, and uh, I, I don't speak Spanish that much, so I just, and class sounded good. So I, I tap this in, then it asks me for my passport number for 15 minutes of free internet access. Like, why not blood, you know, or my firstborn? Like, good thing I have somebody else's passport mine as you use this one. It's good. <laughs> but this is not fun, this is not good, this is not an interface, this is stupid. Copy and paste hotfixes. I keep telling people, code that goes on the web and is a demo in your articles, in your examples, in your style guides, should be the best frigging code you ever write in your life. People take that stuff and copy and paste it out of context. They don't want to read your information, they just want to get your code. So make sure that this is the best thing ever. This is a blog that I like, um, called, uh, the, what's it, Retronaut, like old stories of like what happened in the 70s and things like that. And I found this link to this capsule. It's a blog, it's a permalink. Links, yay, they make the web work. You click on this link, you get a little pop-up style that has the link in it that is not linked to anything. What is this interface for? I don't know. But then I looked at the source code as I got the power, used the source. Um, and I found that there was an HTML, a proper link in there before, a stand class code, of course, fair enough. Uh, and he got covered and out. So something broke. Somebody did not know how to do an event handler or like whatever happened. And then they replaced it with an iClass icon link, first of all, and a link with an ID on it. Data title, data trigger, data placement, data HTML, data content, with the URL in it, and link to this capsule. So we reinvented the internet in a broken environment. Well done. Because we learned about data attributes somewhere. So with JavaScript, that probably works in some environment, or just does this would mean nothing. But it's just somebody learned, you cannot find data attributes, otherwise you're outdated. You use data attributes for everything, that's awesome. You can read it again in JavaScript. I was like, I don't know what's going on there, but you see these things all the time, where people use like 12 widgets on the page and just copy and paste without thinking about it. And there goes your data plan. Toshiba, the other day, thought like, hey, it's a good idea to sell me a new laptop and has this Hero website, which clocks down at 21.8 megabytes in 556 requests. It's as if we never did any presentation or open documentation or books on performance ever. In fact, how do these things happen still? There are so many things going on, and this one actually does nothing until everything is loaded. It's not even at these wonderful like loading screens we have in Flash. It just does nothing. I was just saying, uh, okay, five minutes later, oh, this is what it does. It looks ugly and it's, it's, it's really bad. 
And this goes even further. We have this wonderful thing called a door slam right now, where companies tell us to, oh, well, the web is shit, so you probably have this cool air, this cool phone. Why don't you want to install the app of our website? Because you obviously don't have 320 apps that you forgot already on your phone. And you want to go once to our website, so 25, 25 megabyte download is something that you can do for us, right? It's wonderful when, insult, uh, when injury gets to insult as well, like in LinkedIn's case. LinkedIn just pronounced that HTML5 is not good enough, that's why they have to go native. And they redirect you when you come from a LinkedIn email to the mobile uh, touch.linkedin.com, which is optimized for a tablet. So the download button to get the app is somewhere here. <laughs> and I can't scroll it. So all I get is a fourth of a Nexus 4 or whatever that is, and that's basically it, and I'm stuck. So like, at least put the button on the top then or something like that. But this is a practice that we get continuously right now. More and more websites do that. And it just drives me crazy because it's such a step back. Remember pop-ups? Remember why we put pop-up blockers in the browsers? Because people don't want them. And people don't want to be told to download an app when they put the effort of clicking on a link or typing in a URL. But this is a new practice because basically we told people we can't do that in HTML, HTML doesn't do that. Instead of just making a thing that works that is beautiful and put effort into it and say like, I could deliver that in a day, but give me five days and I give you something good. I want to deliver something I'm proud of. Now, this is a lot of fail. A lot of like, oh my god, everything is wrong. And failure is terrible, but failure is a good thing because you can start anew. Everybody knows who that man is. This is Mr. Tippett. He is big in, uh, uh, in movie special effects. And his first billing in movies was actually a massive, massive failure. Because the first movie that he worked on was Jurassic Park. And if you watch the movie and you finish the movie, the end credits basically say that he was the dinosaur supervisor. <laughs> and the dinosaurs ran all over the place and killed people. There were dinosaurs in the kitchen. That's not even dangerous, it's just unsanitary. He really was a bad dinosaur miner, but he became successful. The movie was more interesting because he failed to stop them from eating people, otherwise the movie would have been a bit boring, really. But it shows that, that if, you, uh, if you put effort in, something comes out of it. So I'm here now to give you a new hope, to fill in the, the last Star Wars reference now. I'm going to talk about Firefox OS. There's no Firefox OS, this is a phone that runs Firefox OS. There's a test phone that you can buy for 90 euros to start playing with it. You don't need it. There's a simulator in the browser as well. Firefox OS, to me, when I started at Mozilla two years ago, was an empty repository and an IDU. Now we have 18 mobile partners, four hardware partners. July 1st is the first launch in the first country. Eight launch countries where people will get these phones. And this never happened before. In the mobile space, this never happened before, that an open source player working on open source technology got that many partners to actually start with. Everybody else said, eh, that will never work. Like, remember WebOS? Remember like, from the other things? To me, Web uh, Firefox OS is the mobile platform that HTML5 deserves. I mean, Steve Jobs hasn't asked us, but we wanted to fulfill that thing that he promised. No SDK. Web technology is good enough to build great solutions, flexible solutions, things that work everywhere. And it's good for that, and it should get the, the rights to get into the hardware that it doesn't get in any other platform. We always have to go through conversions like Cordoba and things like that to access the camera, to access the accelerometer. And with Firefox OS, it's a system that is completely open to allow you to have access everything in the hardware itself. There's not a single patent in that hardware. There's not a single line of code in that, in that operating system that you cannot look at. It's on GitHub. Play with it, fix it with us, work with us, put things in there, please. And every partner that we're working with, Telefonica, uh, Deutsche Telekom, uh, Telenor, Springs, lots and lots of others. Instead of just saying, we sell these phones for us, we ask them, where are your engineers? You build that thing with us and then sell it. Because we want you to be proud of it. We want you to be part of it. We don't want you to be a middleman or salesman. We want to revolutionize the web and bring the mobile web to everybody. Because right now, the mobile web 
It's only for the rich. It's only for the Western world. It's only for the people that can afford a cool phone and have a good data plan and don't worry and have a credit card. You cannot get any apps if you don't have a credit card. How stupid is that? That just doesn't make any sense at all. So on Firefox OS, you can buy apps with their telephone bill or you can buy apps on prepaid SIM cards. The, uh, the, the market, we have a marketplace, you have a marketplace, people just expect that, but you can install any app from the web, from your website, from your own web store. The, the web store is built on top of an open API you can build a web store with. So we wanted to break down all these walls and all these barriers and we managed to do it. And what we get when I talk to people about it, they're like, it's not as iOS, it's not like Android. Yes, that's the idea. It's not like them. It's different, it's much more open, it's much more different. It enables all of you to reach millions of new, new uh, customers in markets that don't have iPhones, that don't have Androids, and that are not actually tainted by the experience of those things. They don't expect your HTML applications to work the same way. They expect them to be different. It has predictable browser support because it's Firefox. Nothing else is in there. You write everything in JavaScript, HTML, and CSS. And it's Firefox the browser, the same you have on desktop, the same you have on Android, the same that is an open source available to you. Now, I don't care which browser you use. Chrome, awesome. Opera, awesome. Safari, okay. Internet Explorer, great. Waiting for a bit to catch up and to release the fucking thing already. But, good. What I hate is stock browsers. They have to die in a fire. And I come there and stomp on them after. Hardwiring a browser to hardware, making them dependent on a different operating system, is the most idiotic thing you can do. It's making people outdated, making them vulnerable to security attacks because they're not allowed to get the newest and coolest software out there. It's, it's just incredible what Android does with that, and it, it, it does my head in because both Firefox and Opera are available to Android for you. They've been backported to all the old versions of Android. Chrome has, don't know why. Guess because we want to sell more phones, or it's it's all it's fast. Don't worry about that. But we have predictable HTML support, and if it doesn't work, go to go find a bug, go complain about it, get it fixed. Write use cases, write tests for us, so we see what breaks, then we can fix it. If you just say, oh, that's broken, we don't know what's going on. Same with Chrome, same with Opera, same with all the others. We need a predictable HTML5 for the mobile space. And we cannot have that if the browser is part of an operating system that cannot get upgraded, and we have this whole slew of old browsers that we need to support. It's also a new market, because none of these Firefox OS launch markets are markets that you would expect. You're like, we're not selling them in Germany, we're not selling them in India, we're not selling them in America. Yes. Maybe later somebody will. We're going to where people have feature phones, where their only joy in life is playing Snake and getting text messages. And we replace those phones with a very, very uh, uh, affordable phone that does everything those shiny new iPhones and shiny new Androids do. Not in the same performance, of course, that's impossible. But in the same way, actually, they do. You get your apps, you can actually surf the web, you get your Facebook, you get your Twitter, you get all the things that you want. Poland is going to be a market, uh, 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 Montenegro is going to be a market, Brazil, Venezuela, lots and lots of spaces in South America where people don't have phones yet, they don't have smartphones, they cannot afford them. An iPhone is four months of wage, and that's just not right. The web is not for the rich, the web is for everybody. The web is for somebody in a, in a small town in Brazil has probably some very good ideas to put on Twitter. And they're not just trolling each other and getting bored because they're, or whining at Christmas because they didn't get the newest iPhone. They only have to work with the one with the 800 megahertz processor. Oh, terrible. Everything in there is open standards. Everything got released as an open standard proposal as well. A lot of the APIs that we have in there are available in other browsers as well. So we make every browser better by that. By saying we go on a hardware that is hardwired right now, one gigahertz processor, 256 meg of RAM, because that's the high level that we want to go in terms to make this thing affordable. We had to go through the browser and make it perform better. And a lot of the stuff that you see that you're using, request animation, frame, 
uh, hardware accelerated CSS animations and CSS transitions came out of that research because we had to make it work in this Volkswagen Beetle of mobile phones, really, that anybody can afford and anybody can go into. And it's wonderful that it worked out. So we got full hardware access. You got the I don't want to go through all of them, but you've got the vibration API, you can make it vibrate, you can detect the light sensor, you can see how far two phones are from each other, so that's really cool to build games with. You can recognize how far the user is away from the phone. You, can, you have alarm API, you can do web payments, payment system like anybody else. You can actually make money with your apps. This is not to write open source stuff for uh, hippie whatever. It's the same model as anywhere else. You can make the same money, except you don't have to wait for two weeks and then get your app pulled without, it, without an email that's saying, like, why? We look at these things, we make sure. We just released a blog post where we said, like, hey, if you want to have one of those test phones, come up with an app idea and show us your app that you want to port. That idea, in two days, we got 6,000 submissions that I have to go through right now. And it's interesting what people think HTML5 apps are, because some of them aren't, but some of them are rather interesting. So people are excited about this because you can do cool things with it. You can do phone calls. You can get to the camera and do, uh, do things with it. Now, all of these are APIs that are in different levels of, uh, of access. So some of them are available if you have your app on your server. Others need to be packaged up and hosted by Mozilla because we cannot give you access to the address group if we don't maintain your server because we don't want a security model of your server. So some of those need, uh, uh, need privileged or uh, um, packaged apps that actually go in there. And I, I like, I know and I understand the model, I understand the problem, we have that in Flash as well and others, but I don't like the idea of packaged apps. This is just the same problem we have with native apps, like why can't I just change a part of it out rather than the whole thing? So we also came up with an idea or came up with a counter proposal um, web intents were an idea to bring Android uh, intents onto the web, but it was just a one-to-one -one ma ma mapping, and it was not webby, it was not a leak idea, it wasn't something that is something the web is like, it's something that came from Java and Android and just tried to go in there, and now it's been turned off in Chrome again. So we came up with web activities, and web activities do more or less the same thing that the iPhone also proposed us in the beginning. So. You can have a dial activity, or a pick activity, or a view activity. Cost control shows you just how much data you've been using already and how much you've got left, these kind of things. And what that means is that instead of your application going to ask the user to get access to the camera, all you do is send the user to their camera app that they install on their phone, that they love, that they actually understand, that they want to use to take pictures, take the picture and get the picture back to your app. The same way uh, they do a telephone call, they go to the telephone app, they have to call the number, then when they hang up, you get the number back and how long the call was going on. So we don't have that problem that we have in tell domains or the map domains in iOS that you basically send people to the app and they never came back to yours, but basically you get a full loop. You get a full request of like, okay, do this, get the data back. So instead of just asking for permission from your app to access everything on the phone to people, all you can do is like access the thing that you already have on your web. And I like that. I don't care where your photos come from. I just want to have a photo. I don't want to store the photo for you. You can store it wherever you think is good and in the future you will maintain. I just want pictures. I just want the phone call. It's up to you what to do with it. I don't want to authenticate on your behalf because this is how Twitter gets hacked every single month or so. We should be in control over what we do on our hardware. We should be in control of how we consume our things. And this is what, uh, what activities and what the whole of Firefox OS is about. I should not be at the back end call of some company telling me like, well, you bought this, but it's not yours. Google Play books, I buy a book in England, I go to Sweden, I can't read it. What? And if I book in a bookstore, I can buy, I can, I can read it in Sweden. I may not be able to hide it, but I can read it. So all these things, all this freedom that we did, that we have on the web, that we don't have in closed environments, will be changed with this. That's easy. Call a telephone number, most activity, dial data number, and that's it. And it goes to the call. I send the call off. Get a picture. Get photo. New most activity name pick. You say uh, which MIME type you want, so you want an image, a JPEG, or a JPEG. And then it says, like, okay, from the wallpaper, the gallery, you want to take a picture with the camera. This works. This works on Android. This works on Firefox OS. 
this works on the desktop, maybe as well, some of it. But I think that's incredibly important, that we understand that we should teach people how to use their hardware responsibly, and not just install an app and, oh, it's a puzzle app with Kit and see, of course it should get access to my address book and my telephone number and everything. No, it shouldn't. It's a puzzle game. Why would I want to ask everything to okay, give it access to everything? Getting the image back is an on success handler or an on error handler. And this one just gets the image back, the results plot, and you can do something with it. Activities and hosted apps also work on Android. So when I wrote, for example, uh, on a flight the other day, I wrote this little game for kids that uh, you can look at later on as well that basically allows kids to paint little letters. And I'm going to write a smashing article about this, how to, done it, how to do it. So you touch it, you paint on the letter, and when you're doing it wrong, then it starts vibrating and it says like, oh, you got out of the letter, and if you paint the letter all the way, then it says like, well done, and it plays the music and everything. 20 lines of, well, 120 lines of JavaScript and CSS. Did I have to download an SDK for that? No. Did I have to pay $100 to be allowed to write my first app? No. I pushed it on my server, I wrote a manifest file, I put it in the, in the store, and I make it installable from the website as well. You can point to that URL in your browser, install it into, into your Android or into your Firefox OS. This is the distribution model that the web is, and we should not give that away. That is the thing we're proud of. That's the thing that we got excited about connecting to the FTP for the first time and putting our HTML up there. This should not be taken away from us. This is something that not many people talk about. When you talk about Firefox OS, you probably saw something about it already, but this is the killer. If I go to a website, if I go to Google, and I want to know Pizza Düsseldorf. I enter that, I get a pizza place from Düsseldorf. Do I want the app? I have to go to the app store, log in if I haven't already, give my credit card details if I haven't logged in already, find an app that does pizza reviews or finds, uh, finds things for me, or use Google Maps, that's the only way of doing it. Install that app, enter Düsseldorf Pizza again, and find an app to install, go through the install process, Hate the interface, uninstall it, go to the next one. Hate the interface, uninstall it, my data plan is done, I'm still hungry. <laughs> Websites are there to be just found, used, discarded. That's great. Like, hey, people don't want to stay around? Fine. At least you found what you needed. But you don't need to actually keep my website for me. So when you swipe uh, to the right on a Firefox OS device, or in Firefox in the simulator, you get a search. That's the same as you get in like iOS or Android. But this search is not only the apps on your device. These are apps on the web. So I enter Linkin Park, for example, as a band, and I get a picture of the band, and I get YouTube, GrooveShark, Wikipedia. I can then click on GrooveShark, see the interface of GrooveShark. This is the mobile interface of GrooveShark. Listen to a song, like it, long click it, install it, or hate it, discard it. I don't have to download max and max of data. I can go to Amazon, it automatically puts the LinkedIn search through. I can go to Songkick, it automatically puts the LinkedIn search, uh, LinkedIn Park search too. I can enter Skyfall, it realizes it's a movie title, it gives me movie apps. It gives me like tickets, it gives me reviews. I can enter all kinds of things, like Ghostbusters, or when you mistyped it as well, quite fun. Uh, type on Ghostbusters, find another movie here as well. So we're bringing the use case to the app, not the app to the use case. Right now you write an app and then you have to pay posters, advertising, and adverts to get people to know the name of your app. Why? The use case should talk to your app. You should be the first one to show up. I can enter chicken and I find Yelp and open table and these kind of things. So we brought the web search functionality into an app search rather than just uh, just installing apps and then having to try them out. It's a try before you buy of every app. And for you all, this means if you have an HTML5 mobile optimized page, it becomes the advertising for your app. And how cool is that? You don't have to pay magazines to print the name of your app. It can be found. So it's time to brush up your mobile sites. It's time to clean them up and not make them iOS only and make them put some text in there so we can index them put a manifest file there so we know it's a web app, and then you can install it. This is the web. We don't make mistakes. We make happy accidents. <laughs> we randomly put things together for the last 10 years, and they worked out somehow. 
And now we have a chance to make the HTML5 efforts that we put in the last five years and got continuously disappointed by native platforms as an HTML5 developer to make it worthwhile to get to a new market that is hungry for new stuff and is not tainted by, oh, I'm so bored with Angry Birds and you have to fast the game right now. These people want new things, want to have the web on their phones. And this is going to be for a lot of people the first time they use the internet. They don't have desktops, they don't have laptops, they have a, phone, a mobile phone that they upgrade from a phone that just does Snake and SMS to the web. And you could be the people to deliver the first very delightful, beautiful experiences for a lot of people that just start out on the web and not are already bored with it and complain about it all the time. Our craft is flexibility. These are all the devices that you have to support with this stuff. And you cannot do that with a fixed environment, with a fixed design, with a fixed concept. Brad Frost is going to show you the future later. He's going to show you a... <laughs> where is he? <laughs> he showed me a tool yesterday that he's building that will allow you to do this and explain to clients why it's important. Flexibility is what you go for and you will have a job in 20 years and you will be happy on the web and you will be proud of what you build and not just playing catch up with native things that you cannot do anyways. So go out and build beautiful things. Build new things. Break barriers. Give me interfaces that cannot be done in native environments. Give me flexible interfaces that make a wonderful thing. Now it's a stretch to say that German is a beautiful language. But it, it has a, it's a meaningful language. And there's a wonderful saying that I find a hard time uh, translating, so I'm just using it in German. And it says, Tradition is nicht das Anbeten der Asche, sondern die Weitergabe der Blut. Instead of complaining that 30 million websites that were shit got shut down. We should bring the spark that made us interested, that got us onto the web, to the next generation of developers, the next generation of makers, the next generation of clients that are not idiots about the web, but actually want to work with us, instead of just them, us for them and hating them. And that's all I have. Thank you very much.